Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Glad to see everyone back here in volume in Cooperstown to celebrate the Hall of Fame class of 2022. Today, it is my privilege and honor to be able to speak on behalf of today's inductees, a gentleman that was born and raised in this area of the state of New York, a man born nearly two lifetimes ago, who was introduced to this great game of baseball in its nascent stages in the mid-1800s. This African-American is from the Empire State. His name is John W. Jackson, AKA Bud Fowler. So I'm pleased to be able to speak on his behalf today. For those who haven't heard about Mr. Bud Fowler, please allow me to tell you who he was, what he accomplished in our great game, and about his legend and legacy. With that, I'd like to take you on a brief American history tour. Bud Fowler was born on March 16th in Fort Plain, New York in 1858, only 25 miles of where we are, 25 miles away from where we are today. Shortly after his birth, his family moved to Cooperstown, right here. The village historian recorded 28 African Americans living in Cooperstown at the time. In 1878, John made his professional debut in the International Association. His playing name became Bud because that's how he referred to others. Hey, Bud. <laughs> so he adopted the last name of Fowler as well. Now, in making his pro debut, he became the first black player to integrate a white professional team nearly 70 years before the great Jackie Robinson. Now, it seems simple enough, but knowing the times, it was vastly more complicated for him than just signing up to play, no matter what his talents were. There was something magical about this game, though, that caught his eye and the imagine in his imagination that he'd spend the rest of his life playing, managing, and imagining what this game of baseball could be. He had a passion and pursuit for the game, and it became the biggest love of his life. Now, Bud's first pro team was located in Lynn, Massachusetts, but with various rules and prohibitions, he was often called to pitch as a substitute on other teams. Now, it's hard to imagine the challenges he faced. Racism ran rampant, even though baseball's color line had not been officially established at that time. This caused him to have frequent affiliations with other teams. For example, while he was playing in Guelph, Ontario, Canada, he was quoted as saying, some of the Maple Leafs are ill-natured enough to object to a colored pitcher. In Binghamton, New York, the players refused to take the field until Fowler the colored second baseman was removed. Despite the passion for the game, the color of his skin forced him into a nomadic career, seeking teams to play for, sometimes because of his own white teammates that, or just as much as the opposing teams. He pitched, caught, played second base. He did that for the Keokuk Hawkeyes in Iowa, he played in the Colorado League, played in Kansas for the Topeka Capitals, went to Indiana to play for the Terre Haute Hoosiers, went southwest to join the New Mexico League, Greenville in the Michigan State League, and he led the, the Nebraska State League with 45 stolen bases in just 30 games. And I learned that he, ca he came through my home state of Minnesota and played for Stillwater. They hired him in 1884. Now they played the first 27 games on the road. They lost the first 16, but Bud Fowler came up and got them their first win. He took, took them out of their funk and he was rewarded handsomely. We gave him $10 and a brand new suit. <laughs> now he played or managed in well over 50 communities in his career. Fowler himself claimed to have played on teams in 22 different states and in Canada. Now that likely eclipses any professional athlete, baseball player that you see up here in the Hall of Fame and perhaps anywhere else. It seems like that song that Johnny Cash wrote, you hear, wrote that you hear on TV all the time, I've been everywhere, man, I've been everywhere just for Bud Fowler. 
Now, throughout his career, his playing ability received high praise. Terre Haute Evening Gazette wrote, Fowler, the colored player who twirled the sphere for the visitors, pitched a fine game and batted well. The crowd showed their appreciation for his work by applauding him every time he came to bat. So he must have had skills and good stuff, what we call today. Some fans loved him, but many of his own teammates and opposing teammates didn't. They didn't want to play with a black man. As baseball's color barrier grew increasingly explicit, his career shifted from a focus on playing to organizing. He was quoted as saying, back in 1895, my skin is against me. The race prejudice is so strong that my black skin barred me. And that was years before, in 1887, the minor leagues had already stopped hiring black players. Now, facing those never-ending and unrelenting barriers, Bud then became a strong voice and advocate for an all-black league. With that in mind, he helped to start four new black teams. He teamed up with Grant Home Run Johnson to form the Page Fence Giants, who, in, who were envisioned as the Midwest's answer to the East Coast Cuban-American Giants. They traveled in a custom rail car, and they went on to become of one of the all-time great barnstorming teams. The inaugural season, the Giants faced off against major league teams, including Cincinnati Reds. They lost a two-game matchup with them, but it was not all lost on Fowler, who hit 316 that year on a club that posted 118 wins and 36 losses. He also had a hand in creating the Smoky City Giants, the All-American Black Tourists, and the Kansas City Stars. Think about this. Some 16 years before the creation of the Negro Leagues in 1920, Fowler was quoted in the Cincinnati Enquirer in 1904 as saying, some of these days, a few people with nerve enough to take the chance to form a colored league of about eight cities, they're gonna pull off a barrel of money. Now I know the field is there, he said, Fowler was described in the article as a patriarch among the black sons of Swats. It has been said by others, the pioneers, that pioneers many times did not get to enjoy the changes they bring about or the doors they open. But Fowler's impact on the game and spreading the baseball to black communities around the country was indeed profound. Throughout his career in baseball, Fowler worked as a barber a trade his father passed on to him, and one he practiced often during the offseason as he was looking for the next team to join. It would, really wouldn't surprise me a bit if he was one of the first team barbers in professional baseball, since that became his uh, occupation when he finished playing. Now, ask any current player up here who lines them up, gives them dreads, knots, cornrows, or color, or who cleans up their beards. Poppy, who, who, <laughs> you know. Fowler passed away at his sister's house in February 26, 1913. He was laid to rest just 30 miles from where we stand today in Frankfurt, New York, where in 1987, the day before Catfish Hunter, Ray Dandridge and Billy Williams were in inducted in the Hall of Fame, a marker was placed on this previously unmarked grave. That event held by Sabre, the Society for American Baseball Research, was attended by Hall of Famer Monty Irvin and one of Fowler's fellow members of the Hall of Fame class of 2022, the great Buck O'Neill. To show my respect on the way into Cooperstown this year, I stopped by his gravesite to pay homage. When it's all said and done, you cannot think of Bud Fowler and statistics alone. Much as much of his statistical record has been lost to time, but you'll have to understand his entire career as a stellar ball player, equal to and better than others of his time, who gained recognition and notoriety for his play on the field and beyond. He played professionally for over two decades, excelling as a pitcher, catcher, second baseman, and he managed for at least 10 of those years. He was listed as among the top black players of the 19th century and never wore a glove on the field, taking everything that came his way barehanded. 
By some, he was called the Dean of Black Baseball. So there's an unmistakable line that you can follow from Bud Fowler to Andrew Rube Foster, who created the Negro Leagues in 1920, to Jackie Robinson in 1947, and through the other inductees we celebrate here today. So I ask, or I suggest, that you remember Bud Fowler in a broad context, not just as a pioneering African-American professional baseball player. Remember him as a skilled athlete who endured obstacles that are hard to imagine today, as an early force in integrating the game, and as a visionary who attempted to create a league of their own when the roadblocks of his time were present, yet he still persisted. One last thing. I personally hope that all of you will see him as a man that loved the game of baseball from its beginnings and as the very first player from this small village of Cooperstown to be inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. So beginning tonight, please pay homage to, to his plaque in the Hall of Fame and note that here in Cooperstown, his hometown, that road leads to Doubleday Field. It's now named after him, Fowler Way, and it was done with much intent. So John W. Jackson, AKA Bud Fowler, congratulations, sir. You've made baseball history today, but you've always been a part of American history. So we all tip our hat to you, and it has been indeed my pleasure representing you here today and your legacy during this well-deserved recognition ceremony today. Thank you, sir. God bless you, and welcome to the National Baseball Hall of Fame.